All right, guys, and we're moving on now to the physical exam for uh, cervical radiculopathy. So just like we were being systematic in terms of our approach of the presentation of the patient, the symptoms of the patient, same thing with the physical exam. Again, we want to be systematic in our approach. That way, no matter how busy we are, no matter how many things are going on, since it's so systematic, uh, we can make sure that we're uh, going through and not missing anything and that we can pick and choose where uh, we're going to be a little bit more deliberate or take our time depending on the presentation of the patient. But in, uh, for myself, for any physical exam, whether that's spine or musculoskeletal, um, I'm largely going to be thinking through the same uh, uh, different components. So for the uh, musculoskeletal component of the exam, I'm thinking about inspection, range of motion, and uh, palpation. For the neurologic component, I'm thinking about uh, strength sensation and uh, reflexes. And uh, lastly, I'm thinking about uh, special tests uh, specific for that uh, pathology and of course in this uh, instance cervical radiculopathy. So from a uh, musculoskeletal standpoint, like we, like we said, uh, inspection, uh, palpation, range of motion. So with initial inspection for cervical radiculopathy, we're going to be obviously uh, looking at a couple of main things, the curvature of the spine itself. Um, looking for any changes in the uh, uh, lordosis or kyphosis that may give us clues to what the patient is dealing with, um, uh, or uh, any uh, scoliosis, especially as we move into the uh, thoracic and lumbar spine. Um, and then we're also looking at the muscle bulk uh, because uh, that's uh, with a radiculopathy, we're looking for any asymmetry. Um, of course, that's going to give us a clue in terms of the duration and severity of the problem that we may be uh, dealing with. So um, for the inspection and um, as, as we'll talk about with a lot of different uh, of these physical exams as we move forward, um, you, as you create your own system, uh, you can obviously start to combine some of these components, uh, but especially early on, it's good to do each one of them individually until you, like I said, develop your own system. For the initial inspection, we're looking at the typical cervical lordosis and thoracic kyphosis, uh, and like I said, uh, any uh, excessive or loss of uh, uh, lordosis or kyphosis can again give us clues in terms of uh, what we're dealing with. One quick example of that um, uh, would be that if someone is dealing with you know severe uh, uh, prolonged muscle spasm in the cervical spine, they may have a loss of that uh, typical cervical lordosis. Um, for the muscle bulk, um, you know, make sure you have the patient in a gown. Uh, uh, to the point where you can see the uh, muscle bulk in, in terms of the upper limbs as well as into the uh, uh, periscapular uh, region, like I said, looking for any asymmetry or loss of muscle bulk. And then for range of motion of the cervical spine, I just uh, briefly have the patient go ahead and uh, move the chin down towards the chest. And for this, I always let the patient know, uh, gently move through these range of motions, especially with you know cervical pathology, you don't want them to really flare up or exacerbate their symptoms. So I just tell them to gently move through the range of motion as much as they can tolerate, because that gives you a, a clue of what that patient can uh, tolerate. And then go ahead and uh, move the head up, look towards the ceiling, gently back to neutral, go ahead and gently look over this right shoulder, gently look over the left shoulder, gently back to neutral, and then try to touch the ear to the shoulder, ear to the shoulder. And that way you've gone through cervical extension, flexion, rotation to each side, and uh, side bend. Um, now in, in terms of moving on to the uh, uh, palpatory uh, component of the exam, largely what we're looking for here is palpating the cervical spine itself, um, uh, feeling for any uh, significant step-offs. Um, of course that's going to be more in a trauma situation, um, but then uh, in the clinic we're oftentimes uh, palpating the paraspinal uh, musculature and looking for any significant muscle spasm or trigger points, which uh, can give us a clue if this is predominantly a myofascial uh, uh, situation and or is this a, a cervical pathology with a large myofascial trigger point secondary uh, component to it. Um, now moving on to the neurologic exam, like we talked about, we're looking at uh, strength sensation reflexes. Um, so uh, at a minimum with that strength and cessation, we're looking at the uh, uh, brachial plexus, so C5 through uh, T1 uh, nerve roots. Um, and so what I'll have the uh, patient do moving through C5 with uh, elbow flexion, go ahead and uh, I'll tell them to keep the uh, arm strong in the flex position. Now, as you'll see for all the strength tests that we do, you, you want to make sure that you're not just pulling on the patient. So especially, you know, if they're dealing with pathology like a cervical radiculopathy or shoulder issues, whatever the case, you don't want to just pull on them. You can, uh, you know, make things worse and kind of compromise your relationship with the patient there. So 
Um, a way I like to do it is you're uh, bracing them to some degree and you start gently and then gradually because you get a sense of what that patient can do. And I think that's a good for no matter you know what physical exam you're doing and what pathology you're looking at, just kind of gently start and then get a sense of what their uh, uh, strength is there and obviously comparing side to side. Um, so for C5, for C6, I'll have them do wrist extension. So bringing the wrist up and keeping it there strong. Again, we're bracing them to some degree. We're starting gently and working our way down and checking side to side. For C7, I'll have them straighten out the arms all the way. And again, <coughs> I'll do it over here so we can see. But again, uh, we have them braced to some degree and we're trying to tell them to keep it straight and trying to uh, bend the arm. Uh, for C8, I'm going to be looking at uh, finger flexion, so I'll have them open up the hands, and then I'll tell them to make a fist, but my hands are in there, so, um, and part of the reason I do this is because, for the most part, as, as much as we can, we want to be using like uh, muscles, um, um, so that you're not uh, using a muscle that's significantly stronger or weaker uh, uh, compared to the patient so that you can get a good sense of what their resistance and strength is. So you tell them to keep it tight like a fist and then you try to pull out so finger flexors against finger flexors. And then uh, for T1, finger abduction, so similar. So I push my pinky against their pinky so it's finger abductor against finger abductor. And that way we get a good sense of their C5 through T1 uh, strength. Um, for sensation, uh, again, at least looking at C5 through T1. So we're looking at the outside of the elbow so for C5, C6, the thumb, C7, the long finger, uh, C8, the small finger, and then the inside of the elbow uh, for T1. And we're comparing side to side, and ideally we're doing uh, both light touch as well as uh, pinprick um, uh, for that exam. Moving on to uh, reflexes. Um, so uh, again, ideally, um, uh, like to at least be doing three, re three reflexes here, the first being the biceps. So the, the way I like to do the biceps reflex is I palpate the tendon itself with one finger and then I have another finger on the muscle belly. The reason for that is that way you can feel the uh, contraction of the muscle belly and you can pick up uh, subtle reflexes so you can get the most accurate assessment. But you're just having the patient relax all the way and then you're uh, hitting your own finger that way you're not uh, hurting the patient. You're also distributing the force across the tendon and uh, like I said, that other finger is uh, being able to pick up the actual reflex. Um, while you have them in uh, this position, you can also, uh, so that obviously that's gonna be predominantly your uh, C5 uh, reflex there. And uh, for your C6 uh, reflex, you can look at the uh, brachioradialis. Um, and again, <coughs> you're uh, palpating the tendon to some degree and uh, you're uh, hitting, the, um, hitting your finger so you're not uh, putting too much uh, pressure on the patient themselves. Um, for the last reflex I like to take a look at being the uh, triceps reflex. So I like to put them in the position where their hands are on their hips. And then I'll come over here so we can see, but um, I'm putting my uh, one finger on the triceps uh, tendon and my other fingers are palpating the triceps muscle itself. And I'm hitting there and I'm being able to palpate uh, the contraction. And you can also visualize that uh, as well. There's other ways to do the triceps reflex, uh, but again, you can develop your own uh, system that uh, works best for you. Um, so now we've taken a look at strength sensation reflexes. The last thing is uh, from a special test standpoint. So for cervical radiculopathy, there's a few things that I definitely want to make sure I do. Number one is uh, spurlings. So you can do this without uh, putting pressure on the patient yourself, although you may ultimately want to do that, especially um, if you feel like the patient's a little bit uh, you know, more robust and, and can tolerate that, that sort of pressure. But uh, one way to do it, uh, I usually start out this way and then determine whether or not I want to put any pressure myself on the patient. But let's say we're looking for a right-sided cervical radiculopathy. I'll have them gently turn the head to the right and then I'll show them. So I'll, I'll tell them, look to the right and then bring the head backwards. And so you can see they're in that uh, rotation to the right and then somewhat of cervical extension. And for a lot of patients, they'll feel the reproduction of their symptoms right there. Again, if you feel like the patient can tolerate it, you can put a little downward uh, pressure on uh, uh, the head to add some compression to that nerve root and see if that elicits or brings out, uh, reproduces their typical symptoms. And that would be a, a positive uh, spurlings indicative or suggestive of uh, a cervical radiculopathy or radiculitis. So lastly, the other special test I always like to take a look at here, um, because anytime we're dealing with a cervical radiculopathy, we want to make sure that we're not dealing with 
a, a potentially more emergent situation like a cervical myelopathy. And so uh, one of the uh, quick, easy ways to uh, check for that is you're looking for Hoffman's and then any hyperreflexia. So you already did your reflexes and you've noted whether or not you see any hyperreflexia there. Um, for Hoffman's, I just let the, the patient know, just let the whole arm relax and that you'll support it for them. You're, uh, you're, you're supporting their wrist and you're putting them into some uh, dorsiflexion of the wrist and then you're holding their long finger with your long finger and then you're using your thumb to uh, flip, flip the nail and what you're looking for is a, uh, uh, a contraction of the uh, thumb and index coming together, an involuntary contraction there, which would be uh, indicative of a positive Hoffman's. And you're looking for that on both sides. Um, it can be a benign finding uh, uh, or variant, especially if it's uh, symmetric on both sides. Um, uh, but the, a positive Hoffman's is always something to raise some potential concern for upper motor, upper motor neuron pathology, such as a cervical, uh, cervical myelopathy. Um, once we've done the positive Hoffman's, I always do like to just quickly check for uh, the patellar reflexes and then ankle clonus as well. Um, the reason being is that uh, uh, if they have all those things, the hyperreflexia, the uh, ankle clonus, and the, um, uh, the uh, positive Hoffman's, then we would start to uh, be concerned about a more, like I said, emergent pathology such as cervical myelopathy on top of a, a radiculopathy. All right, guys, we'll appreciate you listening to the physical exam there. And then the last uh, part of this will be uh, trying to uh, give a concise uh, overview of the management of this.